Welcome to those of you joining our webinar today. I'm going to give it a minute or two to let people roll into this webinar. Well, good morning again to those of you joining today. Bienvenidos. For those of you who would like to continue in English, please stay put. Las personas que deseen escuchar la versión en español, por favor elegir el idioma oprimiendo el botón en forma de círculo donde dice español en la parte inferior de la pantalla. Gracias. Again, welcome and good morning to our live attendees today. We are grateful you are here and to engage in our webinar, Disability Justice in Healthcare, Promoting Anti-Ableism in Medical Settings. I'm Julie Cronister. I'm one of the hosts of the webinar today. I use the pronouns she, her, and I'm a white cisgender female in my mid fifties with shoulder length, light brown hair. I'm wearing black glasses, a black top, and my background is white and blurred. I'm a faculty member at SF State's Department of Counseling, the Clinical Mental Health Counseling Program. I'm the project director. I'm working alongside my project colleagues, Dr. Molly Streer, who is faculty and coordinator of our school counseling program, and Dr. Tiffany O'Shaughnessy, who is faculty and coordinator of our marriage and family counseling program. I'd also like to thank our graduate assistant, Christina Kabilis, who is supporting the technical aspects of our webinar today. And I'd like to thank our other project assistants, Shinui Igwe and Shirley Tsang for their ongoing support. I'd like to acknowledge that SF State's campuses in San Francisco sit on the ancestral homeland of the Ramatash Ohlone. We further acknowledge that we work on the ancestral lands and waters of many other indigenous peoples and nations in our field work in the Bay Area and around the world. We're committed to ensuring this webinar is accessible to our audiences. Closed captioning is available in the closed captioning option at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If at any time your access needs are not met or become not met during the webinar, please send a chat directly to a host or co-host. Access is always a work in progress, so we appreciate your comments, feedback, and support. This is our sixth and final webinar for this academic year sponsored by our Equity and Justice Focus Integrated Behavioral Health Counselor Training Project, which is fully funded by the Department of Health and Human Services, Health Resources and Services Administration as part of a $1.9 million project. A couple of things before we begin, if you are one of our HRSA stipend recipients or you're interested in receiving continuing education units for your attendance today, please pay close attention to the announcements provided in the chat for sign-in and evaluation links. As a reminder, this is a live recorded Zoom webinar. Therefore, the audience is not visible and the audience cannot turn on their video or audio. The the chat function is available for comments, sharing resources, su supportive emojis, et cetera. To ask the presenter a specific question, please post your question in the Q&A function. Q&A will occur during the last five to 10 minutes of the webinar. So please post your questions in the Q&A as they emerge and we will attempt to answer as many as we can at the end. I'm delighted to introduce to you our speaker today, Dr. Aaron Andrews who is a psychologist and has board certification in rehab psychology. She is an affiliate faculty member of the Department of Psychiatry at the Dell Medical School at the University of Texas, Austin. And she has been with the Veterans and Health Administration for 15 years. Dr. Andrews' areas of clinical and research interests include disability identity and cultural competence, disability inclusion and psychology training, sexual and reproductive rights of people with disabilities, disabled parenting, and reducing bias in disability language. She is the author of Disability as Diversity, Developing Cultural Competence, published in 2019 by Oxford University Press. I am so excited and thrilled to learn from Dr. Andrews along with you all today. So as of now, I will happily turn this over to you, Dr. Andrews, and welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Cronister. It's a pleasure to be here and thank all of you for attending today. 
Uh, I am Dr. Erin Andrews, and I use the pronouns she, her, hers. And I am a white woman, cisgender, in my 40s with long blonde hair. And today I am wearing a gray top, and I have a blurred background behind me. I want to just disclose a couple of things before we get started. One is that I am the author of the book Disability as Diversity, and despite the fact that the royalties are minimal, I do want to, you know, say that I'm going to cite this work throughout this presentation. And also, I want to disclose that I'm here today independent from my employment and my role with the Department of Veterans Affairs. So any opinions uh, expressed today uh, are my, my own and not a reflection of the VA or the federal government. So we've got three learning objectives today. By the end of this presentation, you should be able to recognize how ableism can operate implicitly and subtly. Name two types of microaggressions towards people with disabilities and describe one anti-ableist practice to promote culturally competent health care. So I really appreciate Dr. Chronister's lovely introduction. And I want, to, I want to add to that on a personal note that I identify very proudly as a disabled woman. I am an amputee. There's a full body picture of me on this slide because in the world of teleconferencing, when we, when we are only from the shoulders up, uh, we can't see the rest of the person's body. And so in my case, if you were to meet me in person, you would see that I'm a triple amputee uh, and that I use a power wheelchair for my mobility. So while I'm not, of course, able to speak on behalf of the disability community, and I would never try to do so, I am speaking from a place of being a member of the community and somebody with a lived experience of disability. So I wanna talk first about this idea of disability as diversity. Anywhere that you look up diversity in your professional or medical definitions, whether this be the AMA or the Counseling Association or the APA, disability will be included as one of many different types of diversity variables. But what we see is oftentimes disability in reality is not truly integrated or included in our efforts to address things like DEI or health disparities. And the reason for that, I believe, is because we tend to continue to view disability through the lens of the medical model. We think about disability too often as this individual quote unquote problem, rather than as a diverse socio-political and cultural experience. And so when we do hear about disability, oftentimes it's a very restricted discussion. Things like, what do we need to do to make sure we meet the requirements of the ADA? And accessibility and those types of issues are very important, but those are only one part of a much greater cultural context uh, in which disability exists. The other way I think we really miss the mark is we think about disability uh, as a, a health outcome to be avoided, rather than looking at the disability community as a distinct sociopolitical and cultural group whose health is overlooked. So what you'll often see in health settings is that we conflate health status and disability, or we use them synonymously. And when we do that, we undermine our efforts to promote good health and prevent disease in this community. So disability is also a health disparity and health disparities are these differences that we see in health outcomes at the population level. So it's not about individuals, it's about systems and populations. And these are linked to a history of social, economic, or environmental disadvantages that are regarded as avoidable. So this isn't people with disabilities have poorer health because they have disabilities. This is, there are other things going on that disadvantage people with disabilities in healthcare. And what we see as a result is that the disability community fares worse than our non-disabled counterparts when we look at a lot of different health indicators and the social determinants of health. 
The social determinants of health are these factors that directly influence health status and increase morbidity and mortality rates. So for example, with disability, some of the poorer social determinants of health that we see are decreased income, housing, accessible housing, affordable housing problems, transportation issues, and social isolation. So none of those things have to do with the disability, they have to do with the environment. So compared to people without disabilities, disabled people are more likely to be, be unemployed or underemployed, also to live in poverty. And at the same time, they incur higher costs paying for their health care than their non-disabled peers. So a higher percentage of their income goes towards having to pay for medical care. And we also know, and I'll talk more about this shortly, that disabled patients are more likely than non-disabled patients to say that they feel low satisfaction with their health care. Some of the other structural and systemic issues that we see in healthcare for people with disabilities is a lack of professional training and competency of healthcare providers, which is why I'm so glad y'all invited me to come here today and, and share with you. Uh, we also see poor access to uh, specialized examination or diagnostic equipment that is usable or adapted in a way that can be usable. And we see poor communication and a lack of accurate health knowledge and education. A final way that we exclude people with disabilities from uh, health issues is to count them out when we look at research. So anyone that's done any research knows that you have to go through your institutional review board and there are a lot of documentations you have to provide, you have to explain, you know, if you're going to be, uh, you know, working with vulnerable populations. And so we kind of see this paternalistic attitude of always assuming people with disabilities are vulnerable and erring on the side of not including them in research. And, and so this is in some ways an un unintended consequence, but at the same time, it has real, uh, you know, fallout because what happens is then we've got this research and people with disabilities have been excluded. And so we don't know if the interventions that we have created uh, are actually going to work for this separate cultural group of people with disabilities. Some of the other facts I think that are important when we think about disability and health is that adults with disabilities are two and a half times more likely to report skipping or delaying their health care because of cost. Women who have physical disabilities are less likely to be current in preventative health measures like mammograms and pap smears. And many disability groups also have higher rates of newly diagnosed diabetes. The overall cardiovascular disease risk is three to four times higher in the disability community. So even though we see these higher rates of chronic disease compared with the general population, disabled adults are less likely to receive that important preventative care. So one illustration of that is that people with cognitive disabilities are up to five times more likely to have diabetes than the general population, right? So we know that cognitive impairment does not cause diabetes. It's a good illustration of the ways in which the social determinants of health play out. Similarly, disability status puts people at a much higher risk of injury or violence than non-disabled people. People with disabilities are more likely to be, to be victims of crime, to experience rape or sexual assault. And women with disabilities and people with cognitive disabilities are especially vulnerable. And people with disabilities of all genders are at an increased risk of intimate partner violence. So when we look at the experiences of disabled adults in healthcare, they report that they are more likely to have had a clinical encounter where the healthcare provider did not listen carefully to them, explain things in a way that was understandable, show respect for what they had to say, or spend enough time listening to them. And then when we ask healthcare providers, you know, how do you feel about working with disabled patients? They tell us that they are often unsure how to interact with and treat disabled patients and that they feel uncomfortable in these clinical encounters. And yet 
Rarely do we see attitudes or knowledge towards disability considered or addressed, for example, in medical education. So again, we've got disabled patients consistently reporting that the providers are uncomfortable and have negative attitudes, that they don't have the needed skills and knowledge, that they may have misinformation or make inappropriate assumptions about disability, and that there are communication breakdowns. Another way of looking at this is to think about the disparity between the way that people with disabilities think about their own quality of life and the way that healthcare providers do. So we know that the attitudes of physicians and other healthcare providers are as negative or worse than those of the general public. And there's an old but good study that shows that if you ask emergency room department staff, would you be glad to be alive if you sustained a severe spinal cord injury? Only 18% of them said, yes, I would be glad to be alive. Compared to when they asked 92% of people with an actual high level spinal cord injury, 92% of them said, yes, I am glad to be alive. So, you know, this has not changed since 1994. Um, and colleagues or Iazonian colleagues did a great study in 2021, where they surveyed 714 currently practicing physicians in the U.S. across the country. And just over 80% reported that people with significant disability have worse quality of life than non-disabled people. So that's all they know. Person has a significant disability, over 80% of physicians say quality of life is going to be worse. Only 40% of physicians were very confident about their ability to provide the same quality of care. And just over half agreed that they welcomed patients with disabilities into their practices. A little over 18% strongly agreed that the healthcare system often treats these patients unfairly. So there's a lot of problems and we can see it on both sides from the provider's perspectives as well as from the patient's perspectives. So why is this happening? Mostly I believe it's because the medical system was established based on the medical model of disability that sees disability itself as a problem and something that needs to be cured or fixed. And because of this, we see providers harboring these flawed assumptions about disability that are then continuously reinforced by the medical model in which we have been trained in which we operate. And so this is oftentimes completely at odds with how people in the disability community understand the meaning of their own disability and how they feel like disability affects their lives. So in summary, medical experts tend to have this very inaccurate perception of the quality of life of disabled people. Another thing that plays into this is the history of ableism in healthcare. So United States has a very long history of exclusion and mistreatment of people with disabilities, including things like segregation, stigmatization, and institutionalization. And so the medical system relies on these resources that were not designed or meant for disabled people. The problem with this, of course, is that medical information is only one piece of someone's life, and it's wholly insufficient to understand the whole lived experience of somebody who has a disability because it leaves out all of the social, cultural, political, and historical complexities that we see. There's also issues with the disability community mistrusting the medical institution because it has a long and dark history concerning disability. Medicine has played a central role in the oppression of people with disabilities, kind of constructing disability as a spectacle, you know, something to be studied, a tragedy. Uh, and so as a result, the disability community often tends to distrust the medical establishment and its historically pathological understanding of disability. And this is not uncommon with other groups, for example, people of color who have a high degree of mistrust of the medical community. So I wanna talk more specifically about attitudes and ableism. Ableism is this system of prejudice and discrimination that both devalues and excludes people with disabilities. So it's synonymous with disability stigma, 
for prejudicial attitudes and discriminatory behavior. And it's important to note that these are harmful attitudes towards people with disabilities. Harmful doesn't always mean hateful. And I'm gonna talk more about that here shortly. But ableism is analogous to other isms, things like racism and sexism. And like those other forms of oppression, ableism operates at different levels, interpersonal, individual and internal, institutional, structural, and systemic. So on this slide, there's a picture of an iceberg in the blue water. And I adapted this idea from an article uh, published in 2022 by Braveman and colleagues speaking about these different levels of racism. And I have adjusted it to reflect ableism. And I think it's just really brilliant because what Braveman and colleagues uh, say is that, you know, this analogy of an iceberg makes such good sense because anybody that knows about the sea or has even ever watched Titanic the movie knows that the most dangerous part of an iceberg is the part that you can't see, the part that's under the surface. And when we talk about things like ableism and racism, it becomes very important to acknowledge that the, the part we can see, so interpersonal ableism, for example, or microaggressions above the surface, is only the tip of the iceberg. And as you go down, there's deeper and deeper levels of systemic oppression. So individual and internal just below the surface, institutional ableism, structural ableism, and then systemic ableism. So those top forms of ableism often play out in what we call microaggressions. And the deeper forms of ableism often play out in macroaggressions. So everywhere you look, you will find ableism in contemporary society and the media. Just like racism, it's faked into our society. And what we think over time is that there's this cumulative effect of these harmful attitudes on these groups that have been oppressed. Oftentimes, ableism will operate kind of subtly and sometimes even unconsciously. And that becomes a problem because it makes it difficult for people to recognize the effects of their, their bias because they're not even aware that they hold prejudice in the first place. So whenever we talk about attitudes, we have to distinguish between those that are explicit, so we are conscious of them, we are comfortable expressing them outwardly, and those that are implicit. And those are not always known to the person holding them. They may be subconscious, and they're also thought to be more deeply ingrained and can be subtle. It's very important to know that we can reduce implicit bias, but we can only do so through learning to recognize it and reducing or managing it so we can control the likelihood that these biases are going to affect our behavior. And this is especially important in a healthcare setting where our behavior has sometimes life and death consequences. In psychology, the way that we measure attitudes or one way that we do this is using something called the implicit association test. And this is available widely on the internet. It was created at Harvard University. And it you can find an IAT for many different groups of people. You can find an IAT about attitudes towards black women. You can find an IAT about attitudes toward black men or towards people with disabilities. And when we look at this body of research, we find that the attitudes towards disability are among the most biased of any group. We see that family members, so someone that has someone with a disability in their family, have lower explicit or outward bias, but they have the same level of implicit bias. When disabled people themselves take the IAT, they show less of both explicit and implicit bias, but they still show a moderate preference for non-disabled people. And we would consider that to be internalized ableism. Some other general trends are that women tend to have more favorable attitudes towards disability than men. And here's where it gets really interesting when we talk about healthcare. As education level increases, explicit bias decreases, but implicit bias actually increases at these very high levels of education. 
And so what that tells us is that healthcare providers are oftentimes completely unaware of their own biases. And what we call this group is aversive ableists. They have this low explicit prejudice, but a high implicit prejudice. In a way, they don't want to be ableist, but they're harboring these ableist beliefs. And so there was another study that was done in 2020 in the Journal of Re Rehab Psych, and they did a lovely job looking at the prejudice styles of healthcare providers. And they divided it up into four categories based on high or low implicit or explicit prejudice. And you can see that a full 60% of the healthcare providers in this study fell into that aversive ableist category, right? So that's a lot. Well, only 28% in the orange part of the pie fell into the truly low prejudice category, which would mean they had both low explicit and implicit biases towards disability. So as I know all of you know, the disability is a very heterogeneous group, meaning that there is a lot of diversity in our community. And that's one of the things that I think makes it uh, fantastic, but it also can create issues. So what we see here is this hierarchy of ableism and disability stigma, where you have people with physical disabilities kind of on the top representing categorically the least stigmatized type of disability. And then you go down, and as you go down this hierarchy, the level of stigma increases. So under physical disability, we have chronic illness, learning disability, sensory disability, cognitive disability. And then the bottom three are neurodevelopmental, intellectual, and then psychiatric disabilities. So there's a big difference between the stigma between physical and psychiatric disabilities as a whole. Now, there are some exceptions to this. Certain types of physical disabilities, especially anything that's really highly visible uh, or creates uh, some sort of like facial abnormality or uh, burn injuries, they would fall much lower on this hierarchy because those are especially stigmatizing. Same thing with one particular chronic illness, and that's HIV AIDS that is so st stigmatizing, it would fall much lower than other chronic illnesses on this. Uh, pyramid. The other thing to remember is that there are differences within groups. So if you think about the neurodevelopmental category as an example, we know that ADHD and autism are both neurodevelopmental disabilities, but autism is a lot more stigmatizing and a lot more uh, likely to encounter ableism when we compare it to something like ADHD. Same thing for psychiatric disabilities. People who have schizophrenia are going to encounter a lot more stigma and ableism than somebody who has, say, an anxiety disorder. The other thing I like to talk about when we are looking at attitudes towards disability is the attitude holder's relationship or proximity socially to disability. So I'm going to start in the middle of this slide and talk to you about the relationships that at a at a population level, statistically, don't really make a difference, positive or negative, in terms of attitudes and biases. So being a coworker or having a peer that has a disability, not necessarily going to influence your attitude one way or the other. Having had minimal contact with the disability community wouldn't influence your attitude one way or the other. But interestingly, same goes for being a family member, right? Because we know from the previous research that they have uh, the same degree of implicit bias towards people with disabilities as non-family members. So the assumption that, oh, I have someone in, the dis in my family who has a disability, and that means that I'm not biased, you know, this really sh shows that we have to question that. That's not necessarily true. If we go over to the left side of the slide, we have relationships that are associated with negative attitudes towards disability. And one of those seems quite obvious. And that is someone that reports having had negative experiences or a negative contact with the disability community, statistically more likely to have also negative attitudes. But the other one is whenever we do studies, when we ask participants, how would you feel about having a romantic, or intimate or sexual relationship 
with somebody with a disability, this tends to also elicit very negative attitudes. So you may be left wondering, you know, what is associated with positive attitudes then? And I'll tell you, I can sum it up for you in one word, and that word is power. If a person with a disability is your supervisor, your boss, your professor, that relationship is associated with decreased in bias and improvement in overall attitudes towards disability. So I wanna show you this, this last study because I think it does a wonderful job of bringing together the two concepts that I just talked about. So on the left-hand side of this uh, graph, we have acceptance rate of disability. So the degree to which disability is rated as acceptable, going from zero all the way up to 100%. And then if you go down uh, the bottom, each of these columns is representing a different uh, type of, of disability. So we have physical, sensory, chronic illness, HIV AIDS is broken out, mental illness, intellectual disability, learning disability, ADHD, autism, and visceral disability, which are diseases like diabetes or liver disease. So, when we look at this, each of these lines, these colorful lines represents a proposed relationship to a person with a disability. So I'm gonna start from the top and work down. So that top line, which represents the highest level of acceptance is when they ask participants, would you be willing to not avoid someone with this type of disability? And the participants said, okay, I wouldn't avoid someone with this type of disability. You see immediately, HIV AIDS is different than the others and mental illness a little bit too, that people are less accepting of those disabilities right off the bat. The purple line represents, okay, I would be willing to have someone with this type of disability as a friend. And the green line, I would accept them as a neighbor. And the teal line, I would be okay having them as a coworker. And those are all pretty similar except again, you can see there is that difference where HIV AIDS and mental illness are rated as less acceptable in all of those roles. Now, there's a little bit of a jump down in the acceptance rate and we see this dark red line that says kin, which just means family. And that is the acceptability rating when they asked, how would you feel about having someone with this type of disability in your family? And we see, that overall it's less acceptable than those other relationships. But again, there's a marked difference with HIV, AIDS, mental illness. And then we start to see uh, intellectual disability and autism uh, become less acceptable to respondents. And finally, there's another jump down, uh, lowering the acceptance rate once again to that dark blue line. And that represents marriage. That's when we ask people with disability, sorry, people, would you be willing to have a person with this disability as a partner in marriage? And again, less acceptable overall, and then huge discrepancies uh, in particular with HIV, AIDS, mental illness, intellectual disability, and autism. So I like this study because it kind of shows uh, those two concepts and, and how they interact with one another as well. So in summary, the most stigmatized disabilities tend to be those that are the most visible, those that involve mental functioning, and those for which a person is seen as responsible. So human nature is that we have this tendency to blame people for unfavorable outcomes perceived as controllable. And most people think about disability as an unfavorable outcome. I'm not proposing that, but that's typically how we stereotype disability. And we also have this need to per perceive the world as a just place. I don't know if you remember taking social psychology, but there's this just world belief. And we have this, this desire to think that good things happen to good people and vice versa, even though logically we know that that's not true. So the way that this plays out is that disabilities that are perceived as having a mental or behavioral component, so something like a substance use disorder, is rated as more controllable and thus the individuals are blamed more versus disabilities that are perceived to, for example, be, be physical. Another difference is uh, 
disabilities that are congenital are more highly stigmatized than acquired disability. And this is because people make a cascade of assumptions. And again, these are assumptions, but oftentimes outsiders assume that congenital disabilities are inherently genetic, even though only, you know, that's not true. Some are, some aren't. They assume that these disabilities make the person somehow more fundamentally different, that these disabilities are more permanent, and that these disabilities somehow influence the person's traits more than, for example, an acquired disability. So remember earlier I talked about that not all harmful attitudes are hateful? This is a slide kind of representing that. So we have this catastrophized, sensationalized continuum. Over on the left side of the slide, we have the catastrophized side where people with disabilities are stereotyped as inferior, um, as dependent, vulnerable, pitiful, and incompetent. And then over on the right side of the slide, we have the sensational end of the continuum. People with disabilities are described in these overly positive ways as inspirational or courageous or superhuman. And the problem here is that both these extreme positive and negative stereotypes diminish the person's individuality and can be dehumanizing, thus causing them to be harmful. And disability is not the only uh, marginalized group that experiences this kind of overly positive uh, stereotyping that is harmful. So for example, there are a lot of stereotypes around Asian Americans that are similarly harmful. But I wanna show you some examples of what this actually looks like. In the disability community, we call these images inspiration porn. And this is a provocative term. It is meant to be provocative. So you may see these on social media or other places, but often on the internet, these are these images of disabled people with some sort of sentimental or motivational uh, sentence attached that in the words of the great activist Stella Young, have the dual function of making the non-disabled feel better about themselves while simultaneously holding the average disabled person to an impossibly high standard. So on the right side of this slide, on the top picture, there's an amputee surfer. And it says the only disability in life is a bad attitude, which is a quote by Scott Hamilton, who to my knowledge is not disabled. And on the bottom one, there's a child playing wheelchair basketball and it says your excuse is invalid. And I've taken to covering up the faces of these people when I share this inspiration porn, because in doing this work, one thing that I've learned is that often Sometimes these images are taken uh, from someone's personal social media site or a news article or something like that and used in this way, repurposed in this way without the individual's permission or even sometimes without their knowledge. Some other ways that inspiration porn can play out is when we praise disabled people and call them inspirational for carrying out, you know, daily or mundane tasks. So if I go to the grocery store and somebody comes up and says, it's such an inspiration to see you out at the store today, or praising people for disabilities for quote unquote, overcoming their disabilities. And in this one on the right-hand side of the slide, this is an example of heaping praise on non-disabled people for quote unquote, helping a disabled person. And so in this photo, you have a young couple dressed up looking like they're going to a fancy event um, and it says, he asked her to prom even in her condition. She's in a power wheelchair, he is standing up. And then at the bottom, it says like and share equals respect. So we're supposed to think, man, what a great guy. He's so nice to take pity on this, this poor girl in the wheelchair and take her to this dance, which is you know absurd because you know we have no idea. For all we know, he's got an invisible disability. And for all we know, she's doing him the favor, right? So it's just this cascade of assumptions that are harmful. So I think the best way that I can respond to inspiration porn or explain the problem here is again to quote Stella Young. 
And she said, no amount of stairs, excuse me, no amount of smiling at a flight of stairs ever turned it into a ramp. And I find that to be such a profound statement because, you know, you can be the most luckiest, positive, well-adjusted person with a disability in all the world, and you are still going to face these barriers because you are living in a world that was not built for you. So another way that we see attitudes play out is through this term microaggressions. And I'm thinking you probably all know what these are, but just to review, these are statements or actions that are indirect, subtle, or maybe unintentional discrimination against members of a marginalized group, such as minoritized racial and ethnic groups. These are kind of everyday slights or insults or put downs, invalidations or offensive behavior that people in these marginalized groups experience in their daily interactions. Oftentimes it's even with well-intentioned people who are unaware that they're being offensive or that they're having a negative impact. These are usually reflections of that implicit bias and those underlying prejudicial beliefs and attitudes. So there's four types of microaggressions and I'm not gonna get into the details, but I just want it to be clear that there can be micro assaults, which do tend to be conscious, like uh, saying the R word, for example. Micro insults would be like telling jokes that are rude or insensitive. Uh, micro invalidations, these are comments that discount or exclude or negate the experience, the lived experience of the person. And finally, there's also nonverbal microaggression. So you don't have to say something for it to be a microaggression. It can be conveyed through, uh, for example, actions or body language. So I wanna talk to you about how this plays out in healthcare kind of going from the interpersonal tip of the iceberg down through the, uh, uh, the systemic uh, ableism in healthcare. So one thing that we see in healthcare is that providers often have this way of treating patients with disabilities as incompetent or give them this kind of differential treatment because they have this misplaced pity or sympathy. And this is related to a microaggression of helplessness or infantilization when people, for example, try to frantically help a person with a disability, even if they might not need it. So let's say that the nurse, you know, quickly moves a chair out of the exam room without asking the person in a wheelchair if they wanted to transfer. The second class citizen microaggression is when a disabled person's rights are denied because they are considered essentially to be a waste of time, effort, or resources. So. This example, true story, patient with COVID-19 denied treatment because doctors deemed his quality of life with brain and spinal cord injuries as quote unquote, non-existent. Denial of disability experience. This occurs when people minimize the experience of disability. Like they'll say, oh, I don't think of you as disabled as if that is a compliment. The denial of reality of symptoms microaggression is when we tend to assume that a disabled person is their problems are the manifestation of a psychological issue or that they're being a hypochondriac or they're overblowing things. And Olkin argues that this happens especially to women with disabilities. Another thing that we see in healthcare is that providers may discount the testimony of the person with a disability and their reason for presenting. Um, so sometimes we see this denial of personal identity where the person gets really reduced to their disability and sometimes even referred to as their disability. So for example, a clinician saying, I'm going to see the SCI in room 423. So we have these professionally trained experts in healthcare and, and disability, but they may have no actual lived experience. And that's the case of many, if not most non-disabled clinicians. Another area where we see interpersonal ableism in healthcare is removing these entire categories or resources because they assume that they're not applicable. So for example, a provider might fail to assess for interpersonal violence or sexual assault or not offering routine preventative care to disabled patients thinking that these things are not important. And this can be related to the desexualization microaggressions. 
This is when the disabled person's sexuality or their status as a sexual being is denied. And an example of that is when we have providers who fail to ask about sexual or reproductive health issues or uh, fail to ask about their patient's family planning um, when they're of reproductive age. We also can see this over inquisitiveness on the part of providers. There's this distinction between what you need to know and you should ask is relevant versus you want to know and it's just curiosity and um, ask, you know, out of ignorance. And this is related to the denial of privacy microaggression when personal information uh, is just expected to be shared. So someone might just unnecessarily ask a person with a disability, you know, what happened to you? And this is obviously very intrusive. We also see the spread effect microaggression. And this is when we assume that because a person has one type of disability, that other parts of them must be affected by that disability. So an example might be a provider speaking very loudly to a blind patient. We also see this secondary gain microaggression play out when people expect to feel good or be praised or get credit for, for helping people with disabilities, kind of thinking of, of our community as a, a charity case in some ways. The so management of interpersonal affect microaggression is when we place the onus on a disabled person to manage our discomfort. So an example of this might be a disabled patient reassuring their provider, it's okay that the exam table doesn't raise or lower for transfers. And then I've already talked about this, so I won't belabor it, but there is this blame microaggression when we tend to blame people directly or indirectly for their disabilities. And I think the best example of this is anytime you hear someone has lung cancer, inevitably someone else will ask, did they smoke? Do they smoke? So we have this problem with healthcare providers, and I'm speaking as a healthcare provider myself, we can be overconfident in our expert status. And this puts us at risk of being less likely to question our first intuitions, get second opinions, or refer to other specialists request further testing, entertain alternative hypotheses, and maybe most importantly, reflect, reflect critically about the social conditions and the social determinants of health. So we see ableism also occurring in healthcare at the institutional level within an organization's policies and practices. And a couple of uh, examples of this would be a lack of accessible communication or education materials. Uh, for people with sensory disabilities or a convoluted process for requesting reasonable uh, accommodations or difficulty obtaining culturally appropriate communication. Structural ableism in healthcare encompasses the ableism that occurs across the role of all these structures in our laws and our policies. And these can be, for example, state level crisis care standards that we saw come out um, during COVID uh, for medical rationing that were very discriminatory. Uh, overall, uh, lack of education and training among healthcare providers on disability. We have these discriminatory pay laws and these discriminatory marriage laws that adversely impact people with disabilities, or for example, a lack of affordable and accessible housing. Finally, we have these systemic barriers, uh, the systemic ableism that emphasizes the involvement of an entire system. So this is this may be all systems. So it could be, you know, the entire healthcare system, not just one type of hospital, not just one particular hospital, the school systems, the criminal justice systems. Um, and so it's much, much deeper entrenched. So it's embedded in our practices. And these are established beliefs that are widespread and they condone unfair treatment both currently and they're also oftentimes the manifestation of historical injustices. So some examples of this big systemic ableism would be the rate of disabled poverty, the rate of disabled employment, the mortality rate of people with disabilities, for-profit medical systems and healthcare disparities. So the last part of my presentation here, I'm going to go through some anti-ableist practices that I hope you'll be able to bring into your work going forward. I'm gonna start with the individual. The first thing that we do need to do is examine our own preconceptions, biases, and emotional reactions towards people with disabilities. We all have them. Just like racism, 
this is embedded in the way that we were taught in society. And so we have to explore it. I suggest taking the IAT if you haven't already, read works by disabled authors about their lived experience of disability, learn more about the disability rights movement, which is an amazing and fascinating history, which gives you frankly a much more accurate perspective of life in the disability community. Watch a movie or a documentary about disability and see if you can crit critique the portrayal of disability. Do you notice that they're portraying it through the medical model? Do you notice any of the microaggressions that I talked about today? Always be thoughtful about your use of language and respect the individual preferences of the person. And if you take nothing else away from today, don't overfocus on the individual. Recognize environmental factors, including ableism, all the way down to systemic ableism, which has a great effect on the lived experiences of people with disabilities. We need to center the perspectives of people who are most impacted by ableism. Healthcare providers should not be assuming that they know what the patient wants or the type of healthcare they want to receive. And we need to balance being respectful towards patients with disabilities and the fact that they are oftentimes experts on their own conditions and know their needs quite well with also educating ourselves and taking the onus off of them to kind of have to constantly um, educate us about their disabilities. The other thing is important to treat the whole person with dignity, never reducing someone with a disability to the medical aspects of disability. And to do this, we need to recognize that people respond to disability in all kinds of varied ways and not assume that disabilities are always the cause of psychological or other problems. So what can we do at the institutional level? What we can do is or examine our organizational policies and practices that affect disabled people. So examples of this might be, what is your institution's crisis care standard for medical rationing? What are the criteria for getting an organ transplant? We can continue to offer cultural competence education and training to all healthcare workers and very importantly, we need to recruit and retain disabled healthcare providers. Because remember, I talked about power being the, the, the factor that really changes attitudes. And it is very powerful when it's the nurse that's in the wheelchair or the doctor that discloses the disability. So this is um, the, the way that I think we can really move towards change. So continuing down the iceberg, the structural strategies, we wanna make sure we're identifying ableism across institutions and uh, challenging it. And uh, so one example of that was the disability community recognized across these institutions, these crisis care standards for um, medical rationing were very unfair uh, against people with disabilities and they involved the Department of Justice. So that was advocacy at the structural level. And whenever possible, we wanna strive for universal access and design uh, for all people, because the idea is it doesn't just benefit people with disabilities, it benefits everyone. So I'm gonna finish on this last slide. And this is a picture slide with three different pictures on it. On the left side, you have three folks trying to watch a baseball game and there's a fence in front of them. They're each standing on one crate. This represents equality where everyone gets treated equally. The middle slide is where the person on the left doesn't have any crate, the person in the middle is standing on one crate and the person on the right is standing on two crates. This is equity. This is what I think we're currently striving towards is everyone getting the support that they need at an individualized level. But the slide on the right slide is the slide that gets me really excited. And this is where we would actually tear down the barrier. The fence is gone in this picture. We're gonna remove the systemic barrier that caused the inequity in the first place. And this would be what we consider to be true justice. So I'm going to stop there and go through some of my references. And I think we should have about six minutes for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Andrews. Uh, I can speak for myself and probably the group. This has been such a powerful webinar and has, I can imagine has brought up a lot for our audience and I can't thank you enough for this webinar. Um, I am going to look and see if we have any questions. 
um, we do have one. Um, do you know of any local culturally specific job boards to recruit disabled behavioral health clinicians? That's a great question. And, and I, I don't know of anything um, specific. Um, uh, let me, let me real quick uh, stop sharing. Um, there's this one thing I'm thinking of something called like disability jobs network or something like that. Um, I might have to send it to you after, oh, no, here it is. It's the the job accommodation network, otherwise known as JAN. Um, I don't know if they actually post positions there, but they have some fantastic guidance about um, both for employers and job seekers um, about um, questions about workplace accommodations and um, you know rights under the ADA. Uh, they have a whole list of all these different types of accommodations that can be really helpful. Um, so it's um, actually a really easy uh, URL. It's askjan, A-S-K-J-A-N dot org. So I would definitely rec uh, recommend them. And I would also say that you can, uh, you know, reach out to like, for example, your Center for Independent Living or other types of advocacy organizations in your area and put the word out. I mean, the funny thing is, is sometimes we're kind of a small community uh, and, and, you know, word of mouth can also be powerful. And then finally, I think social media is an incredible tool. Um, the internet has allowed the disability community to come together in ways that we never could prior to having access to things like social media. And so I think that can be a really useful way to get the word out there that you're an inclusive employer and you're looking to hire people with disabilities. Yeah, thank you for that response and for that question. It's a reminder too of how um, our disabled community aren't in positions and particularly positions of power. And I just wanted to comment on your the incredible research that you noted about the best, where we see positive attitudinal change is when we are working with a person in power, yet we lack disabled people in power, right? And so I think that sort of speaks to the need for more people with disabilities in our behavioral health and in positions of power and, and, and that. And there's another question, so I wanna make sure um, I get to this. What are the best ways or resources to prepare people with disabilities for a job interview, given all these different risks of bias and prejudice? That's a great question. Um, you know, I think there's not going to be, you know, one simple answer, but I think uh, one thing that's going to be very important is disability disclosure. And uh, so if the person is submitting, uh, you know, a resume or something like that, they may have to make a decision uh, whether or not they want it to be obvious uh, you know, that they have a disability or not. Uh, and then if they're going for an interview, if they have a disability like mine, unless it's a Zoom interview, because in a Zoom interview, I could pass as non-disabled, but in a regular interview, I could not pass as non-disabled. And versus somebody who has an invisible or non-apparent disability, then they have to make that decision whether or not they want to disclose. And this is a very difficult decision because there is risk. Uh, I would never tell someone that there's not risk. Like, yeah, just go out there and be loud and proud as a disabled person. Well, not in this world, right? Where ableism abounds. So I think that these are personal and individual choices that have to be made, you know, kind of weighing the pros and the cons. So for example, if I need an accommodation in that interview to perform my best, I'm gonna probably disclose my disability to get that accommodation. And I'm, but I'm, I'm taking a risk right? Uh, because it's just like racism. I mean, nobody, nobody says, well, we didn't hire you because you're disabled or we passed you over because you're Black. It's just that you get passed over, right? So um, I think, um, you know, for me, one thing that's been important, you know, just in my journey is to learn to talk about my own disability as a source of strength. Um, but that's, that's a skill too, right? That that had to be developed over a period of time. 
So I hope those are some helpful thoughts. There's no kind of one best way to prepare people, but I'm always a fan of of role playing too. Like in my work with with folks, I'm like, let's role play this. Like let's let's actually do this and see how that sounds or how does that feel to say that. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, we have just hit the 10 o'clock mark, but I just want to again express thank you so much for this powerful presentation, expressing your lived experience and this powerful attitudinal research, which I think is so important to, to, to think about and include in our own training. So again, thanks everyone for joining, wishing everybody a good weekend. And thank you again, Dr. Andrews, for this amazing presentation. It was my pleasure. Everybody take care. Bye-bye.